Well, I did mention this morning that this might be one of our shortest sermons, maybe ten minutes or so. And if I was to try that, I'd probably be in trouble. The alternative would be to have a woman in the pulpit, and we'd probably be here to midnight if they had an opportunity to preach to husbands. Uh, their points would be endless. I can assure you it wouldn't be one, two, three. It would be more like one to thirty-three. And uh, they would have uh, take full liberty at the opportunity to preach to husbands. So what do you say? How, how do you ever even begin on a subject like this? And uh, as you know, if you go into a Christian bookstore, the place is coming down with all kinds of books about marriage, husbands, wives, families, and it seems to be the peak of book sales these days. Anybody that publishes a book on marriage, it seems to be one of the big sellers. And so where do you begin and where do you possibly end? Well, I suggest tonight that we begin with a Bible word study. Let's forget what he or she says, and let's forget our own opinions. And I know you didn't come here tonight to hear what is my opinion on how to be a husband or how to govern a home. So we need to begin tonight with definitions. A Bible definition of a husband. If I could refer you in Ephesians 5 to verse 23, you'll notice that the Bible uses the word husband. Maybe that's a good starting point. The word husband is a Bible word. It is in our Bible. Now, the word behind that in the Greek original language simply means meal. It doesn't tell us much more than that. It simply means a meal. A man. So that's the first qualification. If you're going to be a husband, you need to be a man. Now, it seems almost ridiculous to have to say that. But we're living in an age when it has to be said. A husband is a male. A man. The other thing you'll notice in that verse, that uh, the husband is the head of the wife even as Christ is the head of the church. So we need to understand what we mean by head. Is it this part here from the neck up to the top? And is that what we are uh, reading about here? The husband is the head of his wife. Well, I don't think we can take that absolutely literally and say that once you get married, the wife loses her head. And she has to be a living through the head, uh, the actual physical head of her husband. No, it means that she is under his lead. And of course, the, the head is used to lead. And by communication, by guidance, by direction, a husband is to lead his wife. The other thing that is very Significant here in verse 23, it talks about uh, Christ is the head of the church and he is the Savior of the body. Now, this is referring to the Lord, but he is the example of what a husband is. Even as Christ is the head of the church, the husband is to be the head of his wife and to be a Savior. A Savior. Now, remember the spelling of Savior. I almost got caught out in my computer program because it's an American software and it spells Savior without a U. We British Canadians keep the U in and I almost couldn't find it for that reason. Now, it's very strange language to talk here of a husband being or likened to a savior. Well, we need to do another little Bible study. And if I may ask you to keep your finger in Ephesians 5 and turn to 1 Timothy 4 and verse 10. 1 Timothy 4 and verse 10. And it talks about God 
who is the Savior of all men. Now, if we don't understand the meaning of that, we could run away to universalism and say that God has saved all men. All men are going to heaven. We know that's not true. So in what sense is the word Savior used? Well, we have to understand it means caregiver, protector, provider. As Christ is the Savior of his church, he not only has redeemed the church, but he cares, protects, ensures that one day she is presented spotless to the Father. Likewise, the husband is to be the protector, the keeper, the caregiver of his wife. Now, this word husband is a very interesting word if you look through the dictionaries. It is an old Norse word. And the Norsemen came from way up in Scandinavia, and they came and plundered Great Britain. And they took their wives from England, or some of them settled there, but they took uh, Brits for their wives. And husband is a bland word from the Norse language and British. And it simply means master of the house. Master of the house. Now, I heard a preacher once, and I think I've used it myself, that a husband is the house band. That he is the one who puts it all together and secures the family. Well, in strict etymology and word study, that didn't play out. But I think the idea of it is there. I think that certainly is the role of a husband. So what did I learn from a dictionary, an English dictionary, when I looked up the word husband? Well, its primary meaning is a man contracted or joined to a woman in marriage. That's what a husband is. A man to whom a woman is betrothed, as well as one actually united by marriage, is called a husband. I think we'll all agree with that, and we can understand that. But there's other significance. Second meaning. In seaman's language, the owner of a ship who manages its concerns, is a husband of the ship. He's the ship caretaker, managing the affairs of the ship. Another term I discovered was an economist, as a good manager, a man who knows and practices the methods of frugality and profit. And all of these ideas come together to form our bigger picture of what a husband is about and what he ought to be. Now we move, of course, from these dictionaries and these word studies and we go to the Bible. And we go to the first reference to husband or husbandry in the Bible and we find that it is in Genesis 9, verse 20. Genesis 9 and verse 20. And it's a reference to the work of Noah. Noah, the vine keeper. And it says that Noah began to be an husbandman, and he planted a vineyard. So, to really understand the work, responsibilities, the tasks of a husband, you have to understand where this word ever came from, and what we use it every day, uh, yet do we understand what it's all about. And we find that Noah was a keeper of a vineyard. He planted it, cleared the ground, planted it, 
probably fenced it to keep the wild animals out. Uh, well, I better be careful here. There weren't all that many wild animals after the, the ark uh, came out. All those animals he had lived with for over a year in the ark, would they have come back and try and attack his, his vineyard? Uh, they wouldn't populate that quickly. But uh, we see his work that he was about. And he produced vine, or uh, the fruit of the vine, and he made wine, which unfortunately led to the tragedy of his drunkenness. But we could say that he was successful as a vine keeper, a husband man. Now, the next uh, big example I would give, certainly not the next time it's found in the Bible, but the next man I would point you to who was a husbandman, was King Uzziah. In Second Chronicles, chapter 26 and verse 9. Second Chronicles 26 and verse 9. I'll give you a minute just to look that up. It's not the easiest part of the Bible to find. Second Chronicles 26, verse 9. This is King Uzziah. King Uzziah was a good king. He was a builder king. He was a restorer. And you'll notice that God's blessing was upon him. Moreover, Uzziah built towers in Jerusalem at the corner gate and at the valley gate and at the turning of the wall and fortified them. And he built towers in the desert and dig many wells, for he had much cattle, both in the low country and in the plains. Husbandmen also and vine dressers in the mountains and in Carmel. For he loved husbandry. There's another twist to this word, husbandry. The art of caring, whether it be the animals that are referred to here, the cattle that he had, or the buildings that he built, the wells that he digged, the vineyards, the plantations... Husbandry is the art, the craft, the labor of caring for those things. Now, I take time to point all that out because a husband is really called to this work of caring. Now, here's the question. If men were to apply the same care to their homes, families, marriages, as they would to their animals, crops, businesses, employment, the home, the family, would be under very careful management. A husband is a manager. He is a caregiver. He undertakes and he attends to the prosperity, the growth, and the promotion of those blessings that God has entrusted him with as a steward. And that brings about the mandate that you have as a husband, the task that you have been given. Now we come to this chapter in Ephesians 5 and look for the duties of the husband. And boy, are we ever in for a surprise. Because if you thought that you're going to get a long list, as I mentioned earlier, a sermon with 33 headings of all the honey-do lists that a husband ought to be doing for his wife. You're not going to get them in Ephesians 5. Because the surprising thing is, there's only one duty. There's only one command that is reiterated over and over. In Ephesians 5, 23, to the end of the chapter, verse 33, there's only one command, and the command is, Husbands, love your wives. That's it. 
That's all you have to do. Husbands, love your wives. But remember that it is the agape love. It is the love of God giving. It is the love of God caring. And the answer to every issue for a husband in a marriage, in a home, the great answer is to love your wife. And I have to use the the words that the Lord has given, as Christ loved the church. That's the answer. You've got marriage problems. You've got difficulties getting along together, seeing eye to eye. You've got issues that keep reoccurring. What's the answer? Husband, love your wife. But things are not what they used to be. Husband, love your wife. But I'm awfully disappointed. I never think, thought that things would turn out this way. Husband, love your wife. But preacher, you don't understand my circumstances. You don't understand the awful, awful pressure that I'm living under. Husband, the answer is to love your wife. Now, when you look down this chapter, and we deal, get over the shock of the big surprise here, that that's the command and the only command that is given, we have to look now and closely analyze in what way am I to love my wife as a husband, Understanding now the background of what a husband is. He's a a manager, a caretaker, a caregiver. He manages and cares for the blessings that are entrusted to him. In what way are we to love our wives? Well, I don't have 33 points tonight, but I do have four. And I look down this chapter, and I want to be biblical tonight. I want to be able to say at the end of the service that everything that I have drawn and I have drawn out to preach in this message has come from the foundation of Ephesians 5. And I must say, everything that I try to read on the issue of husbands, wives, and marriage, and family, and home, they go all over the place and they forget all about the Bible. They call them Christian books. You end up getting probably more psychology than you do getting the advice of God's Word. So firstly, let me say this. Husband, love your wife unconditionally. As Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. I'm forced to consider this parallel of the mystery of marriage. It is a picture of the love that the Lord had for his church. And when the Lord looked down upon a sinful world and a sinful people, how could he love us? Who was worthy of the love of the Savior? None. When the Lord set his love upon us, we were polluted, defiled, rebels and failures. But God in grace loved us with an unconditional love. And being in covenant with him for eternal life, he has taken us to be his bride, no matter what our weakness, no matter what our failure, no matter what our disabilities or disappointments. And that's the unconditional love that our wives need. This becomes a matter of confidence building in our marriages. Because marriage ought not, from the wife's perspective, it ought not to be a performance test every day of each week. And almost wringing her hands wondering, well, have I done well enough today? The new wife will find that she is trying to please her husband in her home with all of her new homemaking skills. And well, wives, I know that 
Every wife has their own story of those first attempts to try and put five-star meals on the table, which just didn't turn out. And you had to resort to the can opener in the end and try and have some kind of food that was palatable and uh, that your husband would not just feel away to a skeleton. And uh, every meal just doesn't turn out the way it should, whether it's cooking or baking. And then there's all the managing on the affairs of the home, the cleaning and the keeping of the home. And every new wife has this desire to do things that she will please her husband. But there's always the concern, am I doing enough? Am I doing it right? Or maybe we're coming up to that time of year now that you go off to the office Christmas party with your husband and you wonder, do you match up? And is your husband pleased and uh, satisfied with how you present yourself and conduct yourself and what others may think of you in public? And with a little failure here, a little failure there, and perhaps a thoughtless word there, a wife can become living with fear, conscious that maybe she's not matching up, and wondering, does she really still have her husband's unconditional love? You remember the lesson we learned of Sarah Edwards. I've been preaching here about our culture and the way we do things. Well, way back in the 1700s when Sarah Edwards was living over in the East Coast with her preacher husband, there came a time in her life that she was living under an awful bondage that she did not match up to her husband's approval. That was all internal it was all within herself. And of course, a husband may just shake his head, look, catch yourself on. We're married, just get out of that and go on. But sometimes things get more serious than that. Maybe sickness comes along. Maybe there are things that happen in life. And that first girlish love is no longer there. And maybe the joy and happiness of life is gone. And that fear begins to multiply. And it's then that a wife needs to know that she has the unconditional love of her husband. That it's not by her works, her performance, or even keeping up her beauty that she continues to be the apple of her husband's eye. Now, those may be very inner, secret thoughts, but they do keep reoccurring. Perhaps in elder years, when that first vibrancy of life is gone and those stages of life are over, that brought joy and excitement to life, and now it's a matter of staying healthy and getting through the chores of life. It's then, too, that a wife needs to know that she is loved unconditionally. And this is the duty of husbands, to love your wife as Christ loved the church. And when we fall and feel as Christians, the Lord doesn't cast us aside. The Lord's love for us does not change, because it's Unconditional love. Number two, you're to love your wife sacrificially. It says the Lord loved the church and gave himself for it. And of course the death of Christ is that ultimate sacrificial love. It sets the highest standard for us that we might show the love of God to our wives. Now this is, as I mentioned, the agape love. It is the love, not the love that gets, but the love that gives. 
It's not the love that is just a short-term thrill, but it is that long-term desire to bestow. That's the love that is sacrificial. Marriage calls for a new kind of self-denial. A submission. Now, if you go back in this chapter, you'll notice that before the apostle even got to addressing husbands and wives in particular, that he led down this first principle. Verse 21. Submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God. Submitting yourselves in the fear of God. This has been called the key verse of the chapter. This is the self-denial. This is the way by which we give of ourselves in the happiness, the unity, and the blessing of marriage. Because self is the big problem. Self and selfishness are the greatest disrupting forces in the world. And when you are in any bond of union, and there can be no closer than that of marriage, and you are out to serve self, it's not going to work. It's going to be a disaster. And indeed we could say that marriage is God's cure for Kirk, for selfishness. You want to see a young man who You know, he just does his own thing and he doesn't care what anyone thinks or says. Well, let him get married. That'll cure him. And very often it does. Very often it does. And maybe after a little bit of training, he discovers that he can't have his own way. He certainly can't have his own way and have a happy home and a happy marriage. But marriage is the opportunity to show forth the very power of the gospel. A life of self-denial. In fact, where true love rules the heart to serve and minister, it will bring joy and happiness. Because sacrificial love has joy within it. And it has purity within it. And your motive may be questioned if you were to display that kind of affection to anyone else in the world. Think about this. If you were to give the attention to everyone else in the world that you should give to your wife, you'd be criticized for it. You'd say, that's wrong. So it is. But you can never, never deny yourself, sacrifice, give enough for the one to whom you're married. You can never do too much to display the love of your heart for her. And in doing so, it will only increase the honor of your wedding vows and your manliness as a husband as we follow this great example of the Lord Jesus in sacrificial love. That brings us to verse 26 and verse 27. And our third point We're to love our wives to benefit or beneficially, that he might present to himself a glorious church. Verse 26 and verse 27. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ loved the church, gave himself for us, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word, that he might present it to himself a glorious church. The Lord had a great plan for his church and has a great plan for his people. And that is to present us one day in glory. And all the work of the Lord Jesus as a servant, all that he ever undertook in his 33 years on earth, in his death on the cross, in his resurrection from the dead, His intercession at the Father's right hand, all of his work, is that one day he will present his bride, his church, spotless to the Father. 
as we take that picture for the love of a husband to his wife to benefit her, we are to love our wives and work and labor and do all that we might promote and present her and encourage and strengthen. Everything that a husband does as a husband is first of all to include his wife. That's a great principle that's so important. One way to do so is to include your wife in everything that you do. Do not shut her out of your life. Now, there are some men in unfortunate job situations where due to privacy, due to personal information, or due to, I don't know, working for the government or the military or something, that they come home at night and they can't talk about their work. I wouldn't like to be the wife married to a man like that. I think that would be almost to lose your husband for the major part of his life. And he's not only away for those hours of the day and the week pursuing his work, but he can't share anything of that with you. By and large, your wife should be included in all that you are. Not just in the hours at home, but in your business, your employment, your pursuits, activities, recreation. As much as possible. Your wife should be included in everything that you do and you are. Martin Lloyd-Jones said these words, The moment a man thinks of himself in isolation, he has broken the marriage. Think on those words now. The moment a man says in his own mind and heart, This is all about me. and I'm not going to include my wife in this whatsoever. He has broken the marriage. There is a part of him that he wants to be independent, separate from the marriage bond. You see, we learned that in the mystery of marriage, in this union that God has ordained, that a husband and wife in this mystical union are one. We talked about the better half and the other half. It's not a partnership in a business sense where you have two agreed to run a business. One does that part and the other does the other responsibilities and they come together and they sort of confer where they meet in various tasks. A husband and wife relationship is not like that. Husband and wife relationship is one. One in everything. And a wife should be included in all that her husband does. But everything also should be done for his wife. For her practical provision. For her peace of mind. I would say a husband should take this approach. Do nothing that will cause your wife fear. Do nothing that will cause a division. And certainly reason to settle your differences quickly. We have a principle for that back in Ephesians 4, verse 26, where it talks about let not the sun go down upon your wrath. In those exchanges that may come in a marriage, no husband should allow his wife to live for days and weeks in an unhappy, unreconciled state. Now, remember too that your wife is the weaker vessel. Peter alludes to this in 1 Peter 3, 7. Husbands, uh, give honor to your wife as the weaker vessel. So we are to do all for our wives' encouragement. And sometimes that only takes a kind word or a little extra time or a word of thanks for the food on the table just to know that the work that she does is not taken, for example. 
or taken for granted. Perhaps a little suggestion to change the routine. Uh, perhaps your wife would call it a drudgery. A little suggestion just to change the routine of the domestic life at home. Even the suggestion will please your wife. If it never works, the very fact the thought was there, well, the will will be taken for the deed. Another very important thing is to talk. Now, I have to look at my wife and almost ask for mercy here because I'm a bookworm. I can go into my study and shut the door and it could be daylight before I would realize what time it was. Um, I can get lost in the things that I pursue. I don't have a bell that goes off at 5 p.m. or 6 p.m. and says it's home time and away you go and do your own thing. Um, but it is important that we as husbands Remember to keep that time just to talk. Communication, just to go over the affairs of the day. Small talk, little details. Go for a walk together. Just take an hour out of a busy week. Get away from the kids and the family. Away from the phone. Those things a husband ought at times take the initiative to keep a marriage blossoming and on fire. Another area where a husband's duty comes in, if we are to love our wives to her benefit, is for her soul's good. Never forget that you are your wife's spiritual leader. You are her Bible teacher. You are her prayer warrior. And it's important that a husband cares and ministers to the whole family. But certainly Beulah and I have learned through the years you cannot afford to neglect one-to-one -one prayer time with the Lord. I mean with each other. Praying together as husband and wife. That is a very essential part of caring and loving your wife in a spiritual manner. Number four, to love your wife unreservedly. And I go here to verse 28. It says, So ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. He that loveth his wife loveth himself. And then the uh, verse 33, uh, Nevertheless, let every one of you in particular so love his wife even as himself. Now, this, of course, flows from the amazing mystery of marriage, of two shall be one, the fact that husband and wife are in God's sight one flesh. They are not two units, but one. They are not partners, but they are united together as one. And it is therefore madness, madness, to become bitter against your wife. It is madness to not meet the needs to encourage and strengthen your wife. It is as crazy as because you have a pain in your leg, you get a knife and you start to hack off your leg. Now, there might be some dimwits who just lose their mind and they might take an instrument and start to gouge themselves until the blood flows, but they should be stopped. It's madness to destroy your own body. And husbands, this chapter is saying it's madness to harm your wife. It's madness to be bitter toward your wife. It is counterproductive to discourage your wife. Because the greatest thing in any marriage and in any home is a happy wife. A wife that enjoys the fellowship, the companionship, the love of her husband and her family and is living in blessing. 
What a benefit, what a boon, what a joy. But if you're the one responsible for making her miserable and stealing away that joy, you're no wiser than the person that just gouges his own body to the blood flows. Because no man, what does it say here in this verse 28? Verse 29, no man ever yet hated his own flesh. That's foolishness to do that. And likewise, to in any way discourage or undermine the happiness, the blessedness of your wife is, is just absolutely on the side of being ridiculous. Now for all of this, and I really have gone down this chapter and I've sought to lay out what the Apostle is teaching in this chapter about husbands love your wives. But there may be some husband here tonight and you're saying, I know. And I realize this and I'm a Christian. And I believe that this is the will and the command of God. But there are just times that I can't. There is such a strain such an antagonism that comes in our home and marriage that it just becomes impossible for me to express and to give the lead in this example of our Lord who loved his church and gave himself for it. And I feel all I want to do is just close the door and get away. Men, be honest tonight. It's easier to run than to deal with difficulties in a marriage. But I want to show you from this chapter that God does not leave us helpless. And if you go back earlier into this chapter to the verse 18 where we began our reading, you will notice That the apostle began this whole section dealing with husbands, wives. Chapter 6 gets into children and then gets into servants and masters. You'll notice that before he begins this huge section of this book of Ephesians, that he says in verse 18, Be not drunk with wine wherein is excess. And I suppose there's many a man has turned to the booze just to get away from a contentious wife. He slams the door and says, I'm off to the pub and I'm just going to drink the night away. Such is the unhappiness of his marriage. And the apostle says that's not the way for a Christian. The answer for a Christian is not to turn to the help of those earthly spirits. But he says, be filled with the Spirit. That's the Holy Spirit. And when those times of difficulty come when all human strength and human endeavor seem to feel, here is our promised help, the Holy Spirit. And it is then when our marriage is tested and tried and strained that we need to pray for an infilling of the Spirit. Because the Spirit firstly keeps us under control, contrary to the charismatics who look to the Holy Spirit to get them into some kind of a frenzy. The Holy Spirit, when a man or woman is under the control of the Spirit, they are in control. They're in control of their actions, they're in control of their mouth. And those things are needed when there's trouble in the home. You need to guard your words. You need to guard your statements and sentiments. You need to guard your responses. You need to guard your approach. And the flesh would so easily take over and become destructive. But it's then that we need the Holy Spirit to fill us and equip us and enable us to live in the power of and grace of the Lord Jesus. It's then that you need this agape love to fill your heart 
and mind. This unconditional love, sacrificial love, unreserved love. And you will never outlove or outdo the love of the Savior for your soul. How many times we feel our Lord? How many times we turn our back? How many times we disappoint? But he never casts us off. It is an unfeeling, endless, unchangeable love. This chapter has set before us tonight our duty as husbands, as caregivers, caretakers, in the art of being stewards of the blessings that God has given. And whether you live in a castle or a cottage, whether in riches or poverty, whether in sickness or in health, this one thing will keep your marriage to love your wife as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. That's the first priority of every husband. And for that, we give account as stewards of our caregiving, our responsibilities, of our Christ-likeness as we would seek to live for him. I pray tonight that God may make every man here to so live and to enjoy the power of God to do it and that every home will be blessed with a spirit-filled husband and father, that we may glorify him in all our deeds and actions as a Christian. And I'm talking now about a Christian home where the Lord dwells. May that blessing and portion be yours.